Good morning, church. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we have today to gather in your name, to sing songs of praise to you, to encourage and uplift one another. And we ask that you be with us today as we know you are. May everything that we do glorify you. May everything we say encourage one another. Lord, just help us to walk with you, to act like you, to follow you, and above all, help us to trust you. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen. I do have a slideshow. Are we working with it, Julio? Good. Good. It'll pop up eventually. That's awesome. It's not that good anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so last weekend was really challenging for our little family. Okay? The time has come where our daughter has decided it is time for her to step out and start living life on her own and, and make a go of things. And yeah, she's done that before. You know, she was living in Milford. And to be honest with you, I think she did things fairly successfully when she was out there, for the most part. And then the lease ran out. She panicked, made a bunch of really bad choices, decided mom and dad didn't know what they were talking about, and had to come home. I want to tell you all, we really liked Milford. We liked Milford a lot. It was 45 minutes up the road. That's not bad. It's close enough for us to visit her when we want to. It's close enough for us to rescue her when things go wonky. Most importantly, she was close enough, for, close enough for us to hug her and take her out to dinner or whatever it is if she'd had a bad day. We liked Milford. This time things are going to be different, however. This time she has decided she wants to set out a little further from home, and so she has taken off for Michigan and has spent the last week reconnecting with long-lost friends and family from the state that we adopted her in. I don't like Michigan. I have some very good friends from the state. There's nothing wrong with the place, but I really don't like it right now because it's too far away. I can't just walk up the, up the road, get in my car, drive out there, and visit my daughter whenever I want. Can't hug her when she needs it. And to be honest with you, the big one, Maddie and I are 31. We are too young to have an empty nest. Way, way too young. I have a lot of concerns, but they don't stop with the ones that I just mentioned to you. My clicker's not working, Julio. Because my concerns continue, continue to, to, to kind of come at me. What if while she's out there reconnecting with her bio mom after roughly 10 or 11 years of not seeing, seeing her mom, she decides that she doesn't need us to fulfill the role of mom and dad anymore? What if she forgets about us while she's out there? What if she moves on? What if she gets hurt and we can't get there to take care of her? What if her plans don't succeed this time and yet she doesn't have a place to to land because Michigan is just too far away from Delaware. As much as I don't like Michigan right now, I'm full of a whole lot of what ifs, and I dislike what if a whole lot more than I do that state. What I do like is knowing. I like knowing things. And I imagine many of us here this morning are like that as well, aren't we? We're men and women who find comfort in a carefully laid out plan. We like certainty, we like reliability, we like knowing. Unfortunately, that's just not how the world works. Unfortunately, we're full of a world with questions all over the place. We have moments of uncertainty, difficult decisions to make, and a whole lot of what-ifs, don't we? And because of that, I think it comes down to one thing when things really start getting difficult, and that thing would be faith. Faith is such a simple word. It's a simple word, but it can be so challenging to hold on to and to maintain, especially when we're in those moments of difficulty and uncertainty, can't it? And I think we would do well when things are getting rough, when we're, our faith is being tested, to remember the Apostle Peter and a particular story about the Apostle Peter 
So if you would, please turn with me to Matthew 14. We're going to look at verses 24 through 32 this morning. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land. It was buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Peter replied, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, said Jesus. Then Peter got down out of the boat walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Brothers and sisters, where is your faith? Where is it when things are getting difficult? What are you focusing on? What are you looking at? Are you looking at Christ? Are you walking towards Him, thinking about His love and His power and His mercy? What about His plans, His reliability, and the certainty that He's not going to let you drown? Are those the things that you're thinking about and looking at and doing? Or are you a bit like Peter, getting distracted? You're too busy looking at the wind and the waves and the storm, and so you become overwhelmed by fear and confusion during that hardship. I hope we can all say that we're looking at the former, that we're walking towards Jesus and trusting in him. Because just as there are so many what-ifs in this world, there are so many storms that we're going to have to face and endure. It's just going to happen. And those storms, they're always going to seek to overwhelm us with doubt and fear and pain and sorrow and so many other nasty things. And so I think it would be prudent for us to hold this story close to our hearts. Prudent because in the middle of this storm is where we learn a few very important things about Jesus. But before we dive into that aspect of today's lesson, I think we need to acknowledge the fact that we love to tell the story of Jesus walking on the water, don't we? It's one of our favorite miracles. And I think we have a nasty tendency to undersell what actually happens here when we do that. We start talking about the miracles of Christ, and and even those who don't follow him know the basics, right? Jesus walked on the water. He turned water into wine. Everybody knows these miracles. But there's so much more that happens in this passage than just the Son of God walking across water, which no person should have been able to do. There's a lot more to it than that. The first thing that we should notice is that while he's walking out on this water, he's a considerable distance away from that boat. That boat that is being tossed around like it's nothing by wind and waves and storm. And yet here we see Jesus walking to them like he's out for a Sunday stroll. The wind, the wave, the storm, it does not affect Jesus whatsoever. He just keeps on walking towards that boat. The first most important thing I think we see here is that the storms in our lives and the physical storm that he was facing here, they're never going to have the power or the ability to even touch Christ. They don't have that kind of power. And so we see Jesus walking, and he walks up to the apostles, and right there in the middle of the storm, Peter declares he's scared. The other apostles are scared. And so Jesus says, come to me, talking to Peter. That's the second thing we notice here, isn't it? When we're in the middle of our storms, Jesus is standing there calling to us and asking us to believe in him and to trust in him. If he did it with the apostles here, I think it's safe to say he does it with us today too. And so Peter gets out of that boat, and he walks towards the safety of Jesus. And then Peter makes a terrible mistake. He gets distracted. He starts looking around at everything going on. He sees the waves and the wind, and he remembers what he's doing. And he panics, and he sinks, and he calls out. He says, Lord, save me. And finally, immediately, 
Jesus reaches out his hand and saves him. So there are three key aspects to this story. It's not just Jesus walked on the water, y'all. The storms in our lives are never going to touch him. He's calling to us when things get difficult. And he's going to catch us when we trust him enough to call out to him. And then Jesus asks a question of Peter. He says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? When you're in the middle of the storms of your own lives, are you doubting that Jesus is the safety and the answer that you're seeking after? Is that what's happening? Are you in the middle of chaos and confusion and uncertainty and what ifs, and instead of turning to him and asking for answers to your questions, you're trying to handle it on your own? You can almost picture Jesus standing there with us, just like he did with Peter, going, Dale, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why do you doubt that I can solve this for you? We need to stop that. We need to stop trying to control everything, and we need to have faith. We need to have faith because he is standing right there with us through everything that we're going to face. He's going to catch us if we take our faith and we take our lives and we put them into his hands which is a process we start by being baptized. By telling not just God, but the world around us who it is that we've decided to follow, who it is we've decided to trust and lean on and love and obey. When we decide that it's time for us to put away that need to know, that need to be in control, when we finally decide that Jesus is more important than all of those things, more important than everything, and that is when we're going to start picking up that shield of faith. That's when we're going to start to be protected from the storms we face and have the protection from the fiery darts that Satan is going to hurl our way. And once we have that shield up, we need to be very careful to keep it up. That's just as important as picking it up in the first place. Because just because you're baptized doesn't mean everything's going to get hunky-dory real quick. It's not the way it works. Life is going to continue to have storms. We're going to continue to have moments where the winds are howling and the storms are raging. And the moment we let our guard down, the moment we've lowered that shield, we have misplaced our faith. And when we do that, we might just forget that it was Christ who enabled us to walk through the water and the storm in the first place, won't we? And we might even forget that he's the one with the power to calm that storm. Looking back at the last verse in the passage that we just read, he climbs into the boat, and what happens to the storm? The wind dies down. He can calm whatever we're dealing with. And then we might forget something even more important if we've lowered our shield. We might forget that it is Christ who is the source of every good thing in our lives and that he cleansed us of all sin, set us free from slavery, and gave us hope. We might forget that. And when we forget, when we get distracted, we're going to be an awful lot like Peter, and we're just going to start to sink. We'll start to sink because that faith is wavering, because we're looking at the wrong things. We're looking around us at all those nasty things going on, and then we have taken our eyes off of him. We forgot who saved us, and we drop our shield. That very thing happened to the Israelites in the desert. Having received their own miracles and left slavery with joy and excitement, they started to look around and they didn't much care for what they saw. It might have been all that sand. But they forgot what God had done for them. And so they started grumbling. They started whining and complaining. And they grumbled themselves right into 40 years of wandering around the same desert, never entering their rightful inheritance, the promised land. They grumbled about their food, even though God miraculously provided it to them every day. They grumbled about the lack of water, even though God provided them water from a rock. They grumbled against their leaders, leaders who were telling them that they could conquer giants. They didn't like that one very much, even though they'd already seen God do it. He he set them free from a political giant of their time, the kingdom of Israel, kingdom of Egypt, excuse me. They saw the miracles, they saw the, the escape from slavery, and none of it mattered anymore. 
didn't matter to them because they got distracted. They took their eyes off of the God who controls the wind and started looking at that wind. And then they forgot that that same wind set them free from slavery because God sent that wind down, parted the Red Sea, and they walked across it on dry ground. They forgot who should be in control. They grumbled an awful lot. They grumbled because what they thought should be happening, which was a quick and swift escape from slavery and the heat of the desert into a kingdom of their own, well, it just wasn't happening the way they thought it should. It wasn't happening the way they wanted it to. And because they weren't in control, because they wouldn't give God control, they were very miserable people, weren't they? But had they put their faith in God, continued to walk with him, continued to trust him, many who did not make it into the promised land probably would have. And I can't help but wonder something as we talk about that and as we read the passages behind me. Is it possible that some of the hard times that we faced in our lives were as difficult as they were because we were too busy whining about it, complaining about it, grumbling We were too busy wishing things were happening our way and in the time that we decided it should be happening. When we did that, did we just make it harder for ourselves? When we focused more on that storm and less on Jesus, the man who can walk through it untouched, did we make it harder for ourselves? Something I'm certainly guilty of. I have lowered my shield from time to time. I'm guilty of that. I think it would be even safer to say that I didn't just lower the thing, I set it down on the ground and walked as far away from it as I possibly could. And guess what? It didn't help. Trying to solve things my own didn't help. Those arrows kept flying my way, but the shield was out of reach. I had no protection. The storm kept on raging around me, but all I could do was sink beneath the waves of my own doubt and my own despair. And in the moments where we do that, it becomes very hard for us to count the blessings we have in our lives, doesn't it? We don't see that Jesus is the calm. We don't see that God led us out of slavery to sin and death. We we, we forget those details. When we're focused not on him, when we're not trusting him, that is when we truly sink and drown. That is when those arrows fired at us are going to strike us down. Because it all comes down to faith. In those moments where we've dropped our shields, we are leaving ourselves vulnerable and unprotected. But it ain't just about you folks. It ain't just about me. Nothing for a disciple of Christ should ever be solely focused on self. Because your shield isn't just protecting you. Your faith isn't just protecting you. It protects everybody around you too. It protects your kids. It protects strangers. It protects everyone. There's a really simple reason for that. It's because when you don't have faith, you tend to despair. And despairing is contagious. People recognize despair just as quickly and just as easily as they recognize hope. It's readily visible to them. Our faith in Jesus and the active role that he takes in our lives is something that everybody should see when they look at us. They should know immediately who it is that we have chosen to trust, who it is we've chosen to serve. You want to know how to encourage one another in love and good deeds? Show them faith. Show them the hope that you have found by trusting that every time you call out to him, his hand is going to catch you immediately. Show them faith. Show them hope. Show them that you don't need some foolproof plan. You don't need to be in control. Show them that if you trust that he's got this, then he's got this. Jeremiah 29, 11. Keep your shields up. Keep your shields up not just for yourself, but for everyone around you as well. Be a faithful follower of Jesus and a beacon to those who are struggling. And so we've reached what is the end of my sermon today. Some of you might have noticed I haven't done any kind of weekly challenge yet, so here it comes. A couple weeks ago we talked about sharing the good news and how the good news 
is the gospel. Brothers and sisters, it is an act of faith for you to walk up to somebody you know, to walk up to somebody you don't know, and invite them to church. So, we get to do this again this week. Y'all thought that'd be a one-time thing. Repeat after me. I'm going to church this Sunday. Oh, we're better than that. I'm going to church this Sunday. Do you want to come? There we go. This week, say it to somebody. Invite somebody to church. Put your faith on display. Know that God's got this. And show people the hope that you have found. Let's go ahead and talk to God about it. Father in heaven, we come before you asking you to remind us in times of hardship who you are, what you can do, and what you've already done. Help us to be men and women who are faithful to you in everything we do and everything we say. Calm the storms that we are facing in our lives and help us to know that we can walk on water right through that storm, untouched by the wind and the waves, because you're calling us to you. Help us to be faithful. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. If you've not yet started your journey with Christ, been baptized into him, feel free to come forward now while we stand and while we sing.